Ever since the 1990s, many new artists have been popping up on the charts. Take, for example, Billie Eilish, who gained a massive following in 2016 when she released her debut single, Ocean Eyes, on the digital platform SoundCloud. Oh, and did I mention? She's 17 years old. That's impressive. There's something important that all of these artists have in common, and that's that they're able to create a unique sound using external software. And this external software is known as a digital audio workstation. This software has been around for quite a while, and there's a correlation between the emergence of artists and the invention of this software. According to Jay Cadis, an audio engineer and lecturer from Stanford University, a DAW known as Pro Tools was one of the first systems on the market to combine digital recording, editing, and mixing in an integrated product. And the initial release date of this software was January 20, 1989. With technology being ubiquitous today and the willingness to work hard and inspire other people, there's no mystery to why these artists are successful. Welcome to EV Music. My name's Evan, and today we're going to be talking about something that's found almost everywhere in a DAW. Specifically, we're going to be talking about Apple products, so if you have a Mac, go ahead and grab it and download the latest version of Xcode to follow along. If you want to see more Windows related or Microsoft tutorials, go ahead and leave a comment down below letting me know. The reason we're using a Mac today is because we're going to be talking about DAWs on Mac OS X or iOS, which is an iPhone. In these DAWs, they use something called audio units, which is Apple's version of an audio processing and manipulation device. In order to build a fundamental understanding of this device and also know how to use them, we're going to create our own playable piano for the iPhone. Now for this project, you want to go to my GitHub and download the project starting files. There's some important stuff in that even if you followed the previous tutorials, you still want to download that one because I added just a couple of things You'll also want to read the instructions for the project setup because there's a lot of files that you need to download on your own. So make sure you read that. You can also check out this article by Eric Ford. This is what gave me the idea to make these videos and to use AudioKit. So make sure to check out his work. If you haven't checked out my previous tutorials, I recommend checking out because it's going to help you understand how this keyboard was made. And it was made using a tool called AudioKit which we'll also use towards the end of this video. But now you can follow along and we're going to build this, explain all the code in Xcode, and we'll be able to run it on our iPhone at the end. So stay tuned till the end of the video and enjoy. After you load the starting project files from GitHub, we need to add some new instruction on how we can get our program to output sound. We're gonna right click on our project, create a new file, and we're going to create a Swift file, which is basically the source code that's used to write iPhone apps. We're going to call this file speaker, acting as a way to help get our audio to the device's speaker, right? So here you can see we have a blank file. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to call upon a framework. What's a framework? That right there is a framework. It's a toolbox that's going to help us put together what we want to build. Now, how do we import a framework into our code so that we can use it? How do we look for that toolbox out there? Well, it's pretty simple. We just type the word import, and then we state the toolbox that we're looking for. In this case, I'm betting you, since we're working with audio, we're looking for the audio toolbox, hey! But not all frameworks are named like, you know, phone toolbox or map toolbox. I mean, that would be kind of convenient, but it just kind of fit the example that this one's actually named Audio Toolbox. So after we import our framework, we need instructions on how to build our speaker, right? We have our toolbox ready, but we still need instructions on how to build our speaker. And how do we do that? We create something called a class. Now that we know that a class is a set of instructions given to a program, all we have to do is specify it now. So how do we do that? 
Well, pretty simple, just like the import. All we do is write the word class. You notice it turns pink, you're good. And then what do we want to build? We want to build a speaker. That's going to help us get our audio to the speakers. And there's a problem here. You notice we have this error, expected that. Well, this is because computers are like humans. They need to be able to remember the instructions you give them. And to remember those instructions, we have to give this computer a block of memory. We have to put a block in its mind that will tell it all the instructions it needs and it can just access those blocks. I'm not sure if that's how the brain works, but it's how computers work. So this is basically you telling the computer, do this, do that, and you can just tell it all in here. So make sure you have those brackets. That's how the computer is gonna remember what to do. So now that we got our class all set up, we're going to go on a little shopping spree here to tell the computer what we're looking for. And what we're looking for is just a couple of objects. And these are, you can think of them as real life objects that we're looking for rather than just some line of text because that's not gonna help you understand it at all. So we're gonna think of these and I'm gonna help you but we're gonna actually think of these specific properties as real life objects. So the first thing we're looking for that we're telling the computer to look for or create is something known as an audiograph. Now what's an audiograph? So to best describe a uh, audiograph, what it is is you can think of it as sort of the whole modular synthesizer. Now if you haven't heard of modular synthesizers, you should totally look it up. Just go to Google, look up modular synth, go to images, and you'll see a bunch of crazy wires and stuff. You see like these things where you can just plug a bunch of stuff in and it totally changes the sound of the instrument. There's a couple uh, YouTubers who use this, like Andrew Juan, he does some videos on this kind of stuff. And also the band Daft Punk, they've used like Moog synthesizers. So you kind of see them around and it's just a cool way to do some audio processing to totally alter the audio of something. And you can just think of that audio graph as like the whole modular synth. It hosts all of those little plug-in thingies that you can just plug stuff in, changes the sound completely. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually going to create this audio graph object in the computer. So how we do that is objects are actually properties assigned a type. So to make a property, we just simply write the word var, should turn red, and then we do a space and the property name, which this is gonna be an audio graph, generally name the properties what they're gonna be. And then to assign a type, we just do a colon right after the property name that we gave it, and we specify the type. So this is gonna be an audio graph object, an AU graph. And you notice it pops up as an opaque pointer, which basically means that we can leave it empty for now until we actually create the graph. And that is why we also use that question mark at the end to indicate that this is an optional value. It can be empty. So this is probably very confusing for you guys. So I'm going to actually show you a visual representation of what's going on in the computer. What we just did is we created a space in the computer's memory represented by this blanket. And that space is the opaque pointer that points to a location in the computer's memory. Right now, there's not anything in that location. It's just blank. And that means it's null. We call it null if it's just basically zero, nothing. Now that we've created our audio graph object, we wanna add some stuff to it. And the stuff we're gonna add, first of all, we're gonna add our synthesizer object, which is basically our synth audio unit. Then the next things we're gonna add are a couple of nodes. And what nodes allow us to do, they're just objects that allow us to connect this synthesizer object to the device's speakers. And that's a way for us to get sound out of our app. So before we actually create the next objects in our code, I'm gonna show you guys a real life representation of those objects. So our synth node can be represented by this piece of paper. That's how we're gonna represent our nodes. And basically we're gonna place the audio units that we need on these nodes, because that's what they are. The nodes are just a place where we can hold our audio units and connect them so that way we can process the whole chain through the audio graph. So first we have our synth node, this piece of paper. Second, we have another piece of paper which is gonna be our output node. And finally we have our synth unit 
which can be represented by this synthesizer device that I have. And just a note, I don't want you guys to get confused. These aren't the actual audio units. This is just to help you visualize each audio unit that's included. Okay, so now we're back to the code and we're gonna create our nodes, basically how we did in real life. So just keep those real life objects in mind while we're doing this. So the two nodes, how we create those, we create another property or variable. You wanna make sure that var text turns pink and we're gonna call this our synth node. So remember that synth node, basically a piece of paper. Instead of doing a colon, we're gonna do an equal to this one. And that's because this is actually a number. Like I could say this is equal to six or something, but really this is an AU node, which is AU node, you can see right here, it's of type int 32, which is just a 32 bit integer. So just think of it as a number. And that's why we use that equal sign instead of the colon. And the reason numbers are handy for this is because the computer, if we ever needed to fetch that node, it knows, oh, this node is under this number. Then we're going to do the same for our output node. So just the same kind of deal. And then our synth unit, our synth audio unit, remember that. So we're going to call our synth unit. And it's going to be kind of the same deal as our audio graph because kind of the same scenario. We don't have anything there yet until we actually fetch our audio unit. It's just reserved in the computer's memory. So that way we can store our audio unit in that place, in that object. So just leave it as audio unit with a question mark because we don't know if anything's there yet, you know? That's how I like to remember it. It's just, you don't know if anything's there yet. So that's when you need a question mark. And finally, I almost forgot, but we're gonna need to specify our patch number. And our, our patch is just a fancy word for what instrument are we using. Basically, it's a instrument font, sort of. So we're gonna set our patch equal to an unsigned integer. It basically means it's a positive number. And this is gonna be the number zero. I know zero is like, it's not negative or positive, but just think of it as like, it doesn't have a sign, right? So, and zero is gonna be our piano. So this sets, sets the instrument to piano. So for now, I've just set all of the objects off to the side of the graph because we're gonna add them to our graph later. But there are the two nodes, the synth node, the output node, and then there's our synth audio unit. So just keep track of that, try to keep track. From what we've done so far, I hope you guys are getting a good understanding of how this program is going to work. Now comes the fun part where we get to get into the nitty gritty stuff. What we're gonna do next is we're going to add some things called functions. And functions, you shouldn't think too hard about it if you don't know what they are. They're just functions. They're things we might do in our daily lives, such as sleeping, going for a walk outside if the weather's nice, and also eating. Eating's a function. It's just the same in coding. There's no difference, except it's text, and coding's kind of boring sometimes and confusing. But I'm gonna try to make it as easy as possible for you guys to follow along. So the way we create a function in Swift is we write the word func and put a space and then we can name the function whatever we want. The first function of our program or our class here is gonna be init audio. And after the function name, we're just gonna make sure that we have both of those parentheses there. That's very important because we'll talk about what the purpose is of those parentheses in a little bit. Next, we need an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace. This is so we have a place to store all of the instructions that make up our function. This initiate audio function is the main function in our class. It's going to help us manage all of the audio and load all of the other functions that we're going to create. The next function is going to be called create output node. This function is going to create the output node that connects directly to the device speakers so we can process our audio through there. And also we're going to create a synth node. This synth node is going to store the audio unit for our synthesizer, our synth audio unit. And finally, we're going to have two other functions that manage loading the sounds that we'll need for our app, those beautiful piano sounds. The first function that's going to help us load those sounds is called load sound font. 
and this function is basically going to load the sound font. And the next function that's related to loading our sound font is the load patch function. And this is actually going to load that piano patch, which we discussed earlier. And a patch is just an instrument. We're loading the piano instrument. And this function is special because it has stuff in those parentheses. Remember we, we said those were important? Well, yeah, this is why they're important because functions inside those parentheses, they can pass something known as parameters or arguments. What are arguments? Dude, what are you doing? Bro, what do you think I'm doing? I'm hacking in a mainframe. Also, why do you have two keyboards? That's just freaking dog. Oh. Wanna freaking go? I'm about to have a serious argument with you. Math is very important, and here's why I like it, because arguments, like we're talking about, actually originated from the thing f of x. I'm sure you've all been in school, you've all heard that term, it probably bores the heck out of you, and school's out, why are we even talking about this? I'm already graduated, right? But this is actually important for making apps for people, because you don't want to have to write, rewrite a lot of code, and passing something as an argument allows us to manipulate that function, give it some values to work with. So f of x, we need to have a function here, right? This right here is our argument. x is the argument that we're using in this function. And the function itself is 2x minus 1. Now 2x minus 1 is special because the x is the argument. And we can actually change the value of the argument to any value we want. So maybe x equals 3. And instead of passing x as the argument, we can do f of 3. And so instead of 2x minus 1, we do 2 times 3 minus 1. And that will be 5. One more thing to remember, guys. This f of x function, this right here, this x that we load into the function, this argument, we create a new variable sometimes by doing that. So for example, say we have a function here. And this is my send thank you note function. So send note. What we do with this function when we create that function is we actually create a new variable. So just like up here, how we could have a variable x and assign it 3 just by doing that pretty easy. x is now equal to 3. Well, we can create a variable by passing it as an argument. And that variable doesn't already have to exist. So we could do if we're sending a note, we could do string and that's a string. What a string is, a string is just simply text, English. We all understand it, or if you're from a different country, it could be your language too here. It's just a string of characters. So what we could do is pass that note in a string format. So we would create a new string variable, which is going to copy our value of that thank you note. So bear with me here. We're just going to create a string called note. And then after we create that, we could make our function here and end it there. Remember, those mean all of our instruction for the function goes inside those brackets. And what we could do with this note is we could say, we could say print. This would print this on the screen. We could say print note. And maybe in some cases you might have a semicolon basically like a period in programming just to end the statement so the computer knows where it ends. And what that would do is in your little console here, you would say, you would see, thank you. You would see that printed on the screen. And actually to call that function somewhere else, what we would do is in a different location of our code, we could say send note and we would do our note which we just created here and what that does is that creates a copy of the value thank you the string that's here it creates a copy and it prints that to our screen so what we just did is called passing by value.
but I'm gonna show you guys an example of something that's more commonly used in Apple's core audio. And a lot of what's used in their functions is called passing by reference. And before you get too confused and like, what's passing by reference? I'm just gonna show you a program that I made that uses passing by reference and what it can do. So here's the story about this program. So just pretend I'm living in a mansion right now and I meet this other person. Maybe they're my friend, maybe they're my family, any person, and they're just like living in a hut, enjoying life. But then all of a sudden, we're both enjoying life and we think, you know, I think, why should I be cleaning this house? You know, it's too big and I just kind of want to sell all my stuff and live off grid. And this other person's like, well, I'm kind of claustrophobic. I didn't realize it and I don't really like this hut. So we make an agreement to trade and we're going to go ahead and trade houses. So let's go ahead, do the trade, run this program and see what happens. So we just hit enter. Evan has a mansion, someone else has a hut. We're gonna trade houses, because we agreed on that. And then at the end, Evan has a hut, and somebody has a mansion, because we did the trade, right? Okay, how does this work? Well, instead of what we did before, we created a function, send note, and then inside that function as an argument, we created a string. And then this other function, we could call, we could call this function in another place and we could put any value we wanted into it. Just like that. This created a new variable. This copied the value thank you to that variable. What we're gonna do is a little bit different. Let me show you guys. Ignore all this stuff. This is important. We have a main function here and don't worry about the int. I'll explain return types in a little bit, but this is an integer return type of this function. So when the function's done, it returns zero. But the thing you need to focus on is we have two variables here. Evan's house is a mansion and the other person is a hut. And before we make the trade, Evan has a Evan's house, which is a mansion, and somebody has other person, which is a hut. And then we trade houses and while it's doing that, it runs this function swap houses. Now here's something a little bit difficult to understand. We use something, instead of creating just your regular old variable as an argument, we create something called a pointer. And pointers are variables that store the location of another variable. So that way we can do what's called dereferencing the pointer and we can access or change the value that's under the variable stored by the pointer. So it's kind of confusing. It's even confusing for me to say it right now, but I'll link down some videos to help you guys in the description. So make sure you check those out and just know that it will take a little bit for you to understand it. It's all right, it took me a while, but how we create a pointer as an argument, we use this asterisk. And that's going to create our pointer. So we create a pointer x as an argument. It's still a variable, but it's a pointer. And then we also create an asterisk y, another string. And these are both pointers. They're both variables as well. But the difference is when we call that function, instead of assigning these pointers a value, like instead of assigning them mansion and instead of assigning it hut, we assign it the location of Evan's house. So not mansion. This is not mansion when we pass it. This is actually the address of Evan's house. Not the house address, but the address of whatever, wherever this variable is in the computer. And same thing here. And then how do we access the value at that variable through a pointer? Well, what we do is we use the asterisk again to do what's called dereferencing the pointer. And that way, now we can assign this temporary variable mansion and then the variable at evan's house the value i mean we assign that the value at hut so now evan's house equals hut and then the value at y at other person we're going to assign that temp which we just assigned mansion so now other person equals mansion and evan's house equals hut a little bit confusing, I know, but just remember this.
when we call a function with pointers as the argument, we use that ampersand symbol, the and thingy, we use that to assign these pointers the address of that variable. Not the value, not mansion, but the address. So it's a way that we can access the value at that variable through the function. For once, I wanted to show you guys why this principle is actually so important in what we're about to do. So I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of what the program's about to look like. This is Apple's iPhone simulator. So what I could do is I can actually have an iPhone X on my screen. It's pretty cool. It's exactly like an iPhone that you use. You can launch apps, you can launch the settings, which is pretty boring, we're not gonna launch that, but it's kind of slow, as you can tell. But let's launch our piano app that we're gonna make, just so I can show you guys. So we go ahead, we click on this icon, that's our piano app, and you can see this principle in effect. So passing parameters, why would we need to do that in music? Well, in music, there's things called notes, and this right here is called a piano or a keyboard. And keyboards, they have a specific number of notes. This one right here is showing 24 notes. We need to know what note we're pressing, right? There's a specific pitch for each note. This is C, E, G, and then you have your C chord right there. That's some music theory for you guys. This concludes Evan's episode of music theory. Thank you for watching. No, okay, but the important thing is each of these notes, different pitch. So we need to actually get the note number of this note. And there's a lot of cool math that goes into that and a lot of arguments. Now that echo sound you're hearing, if you're curious, that's something called delay right there. And I'm kind of working ahead doing some research on what we can do with this app in the future. So I've created some effects such as delay. That's why you hear the note repeated again. And it's pretty cool because you can do some cool stuff with it. Get some cool rhythms out of it. But in the future videos, we're gonna figure out how we can first off add those effects and second of all, how we can change the parameters of those effects or the values, which can change the intensity of the effect. It can change the timing of the effect. There's so many things that we can change here. And it's important that we understand the basic stuff. As boring as it is, as much as it relates to math, which I know you all love math, maybe some of you out there do, I respect that. This is why we need to know this stuff pretty well. Last lesson here, and then we're gonna get into some coding. But what we're going to do now is we're gonna create another function. And this function, we're gonna keep it simple. This is gonna be a function that's just going to return four. And that's literally all it's gonna do. So we just have that and got our little squiggly thingy, bracket there and our bracket there. Hey guys, this is future Evan, and actually I'm here to tell you past Evan is completely wrong. That would give you an error, because you need this arrow right here in Swift, which tells you the return type of the function. So here we're returning a number, return four, and if you do your var x, you create a variable and set it equal to our return four function and then print it, it should print four. So that's what it looks like right there. And now we're going to take a blast back to the past and learn why returning is important in other ways besides numbers. This is a class right here that returns an error message. We have a function here, a class function, which is kind of a special type of function. I won't get into too much detail to confuse you guys, but this function actually returns a string and it inputs, it takes an OS status as an input. And here we have many different cases and cases are exactly what they are, they're cases. So if this OS status here is equal to what it says here, then it's going to return a string. Remember English, it's just English. It's 
our language. That's what a string is, a string of characters. You know, your alphabet, each letter of the alphabet is a character, and this is a string of characters. So this is going to return AU graph node not found when the OS status is equal to this right here, this black text. When our OS status is K AU graph error node not found, this class func is going to return AU graph node not found. And that's going to return that inside our thing. So we're going to see this on our console when we when we get that error, we're going to see AU graph node not found. It's going to put that on our screen so we can see it. Now that you might understand better what this class actually does, I just wanted to, you to understand that. But lucky for you, I'm going to include this file inside of our project. So if you download the starting project files on the GitHub, you will find this file in your project and it will already be set up but we are going to set up the function that actually makes use out of this. So that's why I wanted to teach it to you.